entering Rosh Hashanah tonight overrides the need to do the Kabbalat Shabbat service, even though we're entering Shabbat as well. Our spiritual preparation makes redundant, we'd like to think anyway, the spiritual exercise that that service and those psalms accomplish. So I ask, have we really done the spiritual work that that exercise does? So to remind you, the psalms on Friday night take us on a little bit of a journey. We're a deer entering the forest, bearing no burden, and then we're supposed to begin to, by listening to the sounds coming all around us, the sounds coming from the sky, the sounds coming from the grass, from the trees, from the animals, from insects, from the water in the brooks, from the life that's in the ocean. And as we add a new sound on this journey of concentration, of tikkun ha-nefesh, we hear a harmony. As we feel invited to join in with it, we then feel invited to restore that harmony to our human relationships. In other words, enter the world without ego, get quiet, actively listen, and act accordingly. The journey completes when we arrive at, well, almost completes when we arrive at Har Kod Sho, the holy mountain at Psalm 29, and then the voice of Adonai enters, not as a whisper, not as a still small voice, but 18 times as a voice that thunders over the waters, shatters the steeders of Lebanon, strips the forest bare. And then it says, that's the voice of our sovereign blessing us with peace. Why is it that God's voice doesn't answer as a small inner voice that we reach through silence, but rather in these loud, threatening, seemingly destructive sounds? And how is that a blessing of peace? Psalm 29, which we do when we parade the scroll as well, actually has that phrase, kol Adonai, this kol, kol, kol of God, the sound of God, the voice of God seven times. God speaking to us in voices, in kolot, echoing what it says at Mount Sinai, the hard cod show, with the thunder, the kolot that was coming from the sky, many voices. And Shabbat helps us to be there again. There's a lot of gematria that the, that the mystics do with this, but they actually multiply those 18 times God's name appear by each of the letters, and they arrive at 72. By doing the process, not only are you enlivened 18, but you reach a state of chesed, of renewed love. And they even count out up all the first letters of each of the Psalms, and they get to 430, which is gematria for nefesh, for soul, for spirit. The process is meant to reconnect our spirit to God. The process of filtering out the noise of the weak, our own getting in our own way, so we can hear God voices, is the spiritual exercise of tikkun nefesh, a healing and fixing of our soul. When I was younger, I was entranced by movies that pictured wanderers and monks and holy people out on the edge of the Tibetan plateau, meditating to hear the still small voice within. I now think that, like in the razor's edge, that that was my search to hear my own voice. Today, I experience God's voices as coming as many voices, just as at Mount Sinai, accompanied by shofar blasts that are yelling, I need to be heard. I'm not being heard. I need to be heard. Unmute me. I'm trying to tell you something. The voices of the streets of Portland of Minneapolis and of Detroit, but not only those, of the earth, of my loved ones, the people whom I claim to listen to the most, but probably have learned to tune out the most, or whose voices get lost in the noise I'm making. When someone isn't being heard, they get louder. Maybe that's why the sounds and the voice of God get so loud. Shabbat is trying to teach us how to listen. The shofar calls every day of every year. It's always blasting, not just on Rosh Hashanah. Some of these calls have been going on for some time, and they get louder. God is calling for us to take purposeful action. And this requires not getting rid of the noise outside of us, but get of getting rid of the noise inside of us. That's the purpose of Shabbat and the purpose of Torah, filtering out the non-essential voices and listening to the voice that's been repeating itself over and over, 
telling us what's essential. The 20th century biologist, it sounds so dated now, like it's such a long time ago, the 20th century, but you know I love him, the writer Lewis Thomas. He used to say that the defining feature of human beings was this communication that we make. We're sort of solitary creatures, but we need to work together. So we talk, 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 and then they talk, talk, talk back to me, and we make these sounds over and over, and he asks, is it music or does it become noise? Is it a blessing or is it a curse, verbal communication? He says, were an alien to visit us and not know our languages, they'd see us just making endless amounts of noise to each other. And isn't it amazing that he, lived that he wrote that before the cell phone or the internet or social media? Today, if you're a, a parent, maybe not even a parent, during pandemic, you see the most popular game on the Nintendo is a game called Animal Crossing. And the entire sort of charming game is that you walk around in villages and these little creatures come up to you and go bzz, 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 And then you press a button so you say bzz, 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 back to them. It's all, it sounds a lot like the noise we make all of the time. It only goes on for an hour or two or a couple of hundred hours. Noise can prevent us from hearing what is essential. And that's what the Psalms are trying to tell us. Now I know that the pandemic has brought with it tremendous loss and destruction, disconnection and confusion, insecurity and anxiety. But it has also brought gifts with it as well. It has made it literally impossible to continue doing things as we've done them before. It has forced us to stop. That's the meaning of Shabbat, to cease. As a myriad of decisions face us, just as, not just occasionally, but often on an almost daily basis, serious decisions about whether and how we work, how we educate our children, how we care for our parents and our grandparents and our children and our grandchildren, how we balance risk with necessity, with choice. Each of our choices is revealed in its kavod, its weightiness. I know I'm incredibly privileged. I know I'm lucky to have a job. Do I give it up? Some people ask the question. They have to face a question like, do I give up my job because I have children at home who need me? Or I care for someone who's at risk? If I'm not lucky enough to work from home, do I turn away a child that needs me for fear of interrupting the Zoom meeting and looking unprofessional? Will I risk losing my job or not advancing? Do we face choices, so many of us. Do I choose between utter social isolation and physical isolation? Or do I take the risks of taking a walk with a friend or going grocery shopping? At first, when so many of these decisions were upon us, I wonder if you were like me. And much of what I did was a combination of three things. Trying to simulate as much as I could from before, just squeezing it in in the new rules. Or talking a lot about the new situation and making a lot of bzz, 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 bzz. How about you? Bzz, 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 bzz. Or was that avoid listening to the decisions I needed to make and putting them off? As those strategies came to an end, I found myself claiming space. Or should I say that the pandemic was claiming the space for me? A space to get comfortable with the discomfort. And against all logic, to find that that discomfort or the comfort with that discomfort, rather than what I feel my normal life is, which is I do a lot of biz, biz, biz about my discomfort with what really is comfort started to still this noise. With the help of my amazing spouse, we adopted one deceptively simple exercise to face the decisions that we had to make. And here it is. It's the question we apply over and over again to break through the noise and to get at what is essential. What is the most important thing I should be doing with my time and resources right now? What's the most essential, important thing for me to be doing with my time and resources right now? 
Which friends do I establish contact with? Which emails do I answer? Do I talk to my child? Do I go drop off food at someone's home? Do I repair my relationship with someone at risk? Do I prepare for my work meeting? Do I find a way to give back to the community? All are so important. So Nadav, take a breath. Be comfortable with the discomfort of knowing that it's all important. And ask yourself, what's the most important thing to do with my time and resources right now? Let the noise inside dissipate and let the hearing begin. Where is the shofar blast calling me to? Which mountain? And then you'll know the right answer to that question, or at least you'll have an answer that in the future you'll have peace that at least you came to that decision with that clarity. We rely a lot, Lynn and I, on the book Essentialism by Greg McCowan, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. He points out, as I did in a sermon this past year, and many of you I bet do to your friends, that the English word priority, up until modern times, could only refer to a single item. There was no such thing as the plural. You couldn't have priorities. Only one thing could be the most important thing. You can't have most important thing number two, most important thing number three. You couldn't say that's the most important thing to do first and that's the priority to do second, because that's the noise. You also can not have more than one alternative. We have gotten so busy in our lives, we're trying to do so much at the same time in normal times. We're putting so much pressure on ourselves to be everything for everybody, to work night and day, to answer every email, to take care of every grandchild. And when we find ourselves falling short, there's no shortage of people on social media or in our, social, in our social circle or at work to tell us that we just need to learn how to prioritize better, be more efficient. But the pandemic has put the lie to it. It's made it impossible to live that way. You will crush yourself trying to do it all. For months, I was writing out, running out of steam by 5 p.m., sometimes by 4.30, sometimes earlier. That's basically a half day for me. I was so touched when I was speaking with one of our members here, who has dozens of people she supervises, all now working from home, and I asked her, what do you say to them? How do you handle it? She says, I say one thing, and I repeat it over and over. Forgive yourself for not being like you were before. If you are even at 50%, that's the maximum level of productivity you should be seeking. And if you need to attend to what has priority, that is what I want you to do. Go take care of what you need to take care of. And realize the tremendous limitation on your time and your energy. I can only imagine what decisions you're facing in your life. I feel terrible that mine even seem hard for me when I'm so privileged. People strain to donate to the synagogue so that I can have an income to do what I love to do and do the mission I believe in, and I get to have a house and a family. And I'm afraid you'll find the decisions I'm about to share with you privileged and bourgeois. Please give me the benefit that I know they are. Do I move my immunocompromised 94-year-old father-in-law in with us, as was the plan, so that he's not alone and we can care for him and he can see his grandchildren? Or do I continue to have him completely isolated in his apartment for another year, with only an occasional phone call and groceries at his door? And it doesn't really help when you're deaf. With whom do I stretch? to maintain ongoing relationships by Zoom? Do I send my children back to in-person school, or to Zoom school, or to homeschool? Will I be damaging them with the wrong decision? What are the experts saying? What's everybody else doing? And then I realized I'm back to the noise and the avoidance. Articles and articles, noise and noise. Just sit with the question. What is the most important thing I need to do with my time and resources right now? We spend our lives trying to do it all. Someone says your child will benefit from this activity, so it seems selfish to damage them by depriving them of it. 
something that might give them more friends or make them more fit or meet their passion. We give our way, our time, and our resources constantly, our energy divided to many activities. And the result is that we have the unfulfilling experience of making a millimeter of progress in a million directions, as the author of the book says. When we attempt to invest in everything at once, it's an act also of not choosing. The part of the reason we don't choose is because it can feel like a loss and because we haven't learned to say no. People are expecting yeses. Lots and lots of action can be a way of not doing the most important action, which is choosing. So the pandemic has forced us to stop. It has prevented us from saying yes to all the invitations. We can try to spend it trying to recreate what life was like before, the plethora of options we were living through somehow making them safe in a time of COVID, or we can accept this gigantic Shabbat, this gigantic tikkun hanefesh, this healing of the soul that has forced us to stop. The pandemic reminds us that life is not about how to get more things done. It's about how to get the right things done, personally and as a community. You cannot hear the voice of Torah or of God if you are constantly engaged in the noise of the non-essential. The shofar blasts are calls to focus on purposeful action that will create a meaningful life. I want to share, I hope you don't think this is too nepotistic. Nep, too, too nepotistic. So Ziva, I don't know if you can see this, Ziva wrote this um, at home one day, sitting at the table. I asked her for permission to read it. And what it says is, it's an essay called COVID-19. And I know I'm lucky to have this, but please, this is Friday night. It's the sweetness of Yom Tov. To most people, COVID is a very, it's very, very, very bad. But some things about COVID are good. These are some good things. I get to spend 100 time more time with my dad. Usually, <clears throat> I basically don't get to see my dad at all. But now he is home 100% more. So thank you. But, and she tells me I'm supposed to sing this part, we need a vaccine for COVID-19. We need a vaccine for COVID-19. Is it just coincidence that Rosh Hashanah coincides with Shabbat this year? Or is this the year of the Shabbat rest? Maybe that's why we didn't need the Psalms tonight. We are doing that spiritual work already. Thank God for Rosh Hashanah. Thank God for a fresh start to this year, a chance to change our relationship to this beautiful world and each of its inhabitants. Happy birthday, world. Let our hearkening to what you are trying to say to your shofar blasts be our gift to you. <laughs>